Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Maziar, for the introduction. And also, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present the work that we have done. Um, you already mentioned the uh, topic, and um, this is really uh, a part of the work that I have done for my master thesis at the University of Sarajevo at Faculty of Civil Engineering. And um, after uh, contacting Maziar and talking to him, um, uh, me and with the help of my professors, Senat Medic and Mustafa Krasnica, we uh, concentrated on this part of our work, the modeling of these reinforced concrete walls in Diana, and expanded that work a little bit and then formed a presentation like this. So uh, that's what I will be presenting today. First, let's look at the summary and what exactly will I be uh, talking today. Um, it's really split into these kind of four parts. Uh, so, first of all, I will talk about uh, our motivation to uh, make this work, um, mention the earthquake load, uh, what it really means, and uh, uh, the importance of the interaction between this kind of load with our structures, all the uh, specific things. And then um, the system that we used, the uh, system that we decided for, the reinforced concrete walls and also mention uh, the capacity design method and how it comes into play here and why is it uh, important. Uh, next, the, uh, a very important part of uh, my master thesis and of all of this work was the experimental research. And uh, it was uh, the research that was performed at the University of Zurich and that's the research that we used uh, for this work. So I will uh, explain the over overview of that research, uh, the materials that the researchers used and present the results, some of the results that they uh, gathered. Uh, then the main part of the webinar and of our work really is the numerical modeling in uh, Diana. Uh, here I will be talking about our model, explain exactly uh, what we did and why we did it and how it corresponds to the experimental research um, that we used. So explain uh, the, all the materials, the, the models for materials and then present the results that uh, we gathered. In the end, um, I will make a, a conclusion uh, through the comparisons of uh, results with the experimental research. So uh, right now I can say that uh, we will be fo focusing on the four displacement curves and the formation of cracks for these walls. Uh, so first of all, uh, the motivation and uh, what is earthquake load, so I won't take too much time here explaining the earthquake load. I just want to say how it's a very specific load comparing it uh, to others. Obviously, we have a uh, focus point and uh, the epicenter as a projection uh, on, the, uh, on the land, and we have the seismic waves. And then what interests us here is the um, interaction between the, our structure and uh, these seismic waves and what do they do to our uh, structures. So, so first of all it's important uh, uh, to mention how uh, for this kind of load we have uh, significant uh, cyclic loads. So um, we have uh, uh, the application of this kind of load in both directions on, on the structure so it's uh, subjected to uh, cyclic loading. Uh, and uh, what it does to uh, our structure is that it uh, causes a uh, dynamic response. Um, and also another very specific thing for this kind of load is that uh, even for m m moderate intensities of earthquake, uh, we have uh, certain parts of the structure um, entering a uh, nonlinear area or rather um, causing a, a nonlinear response from uh, our structure. Um, so, uh, I want to mention how uh, just a couple of examples of uh, what uh, earthquake loads um, are capable uh, of doing. Uh, I uh, singled out here a couple of um, more recent, uh, recent uh, examples of uh, earthquake load, loading without going into the uh, very systems that were used for these specific structures, just to just wanted to show how uh, devastating it can be and how it uh, still is. And also even more recently uh, and kind of uh, very close to us uh, in Albania, unfortunately, just a week ago really, a series of uh, uh, earthquakes happened and there was a lot of damage and a lot of destructions and uh, loss of human lives 
so in general, uh, when deciding for, for uh, a work to do, this was also kind of our motivation because we know how uh, dangerous earthquakes are and uh, obviously uh, wanted to try to contribute to this work uh, as much as possible. The final conclusion for, for them would be that they are still the most devastating load, load for uh, our structures. So we wanted to see what can we do, what can we explore. Um, next, the, the system that uh, is mentioned in uh, the very uh, uh, name of the topic are the reinforced concrete walls. Uh, so the experimental research, as you'll see later, was uh, performed on reinforced concrete walls. But just uh, after talking to my professors, uh, uh, we decided and we concluded that this was really a um, topic to pursue because uh, at least in our country and in these parts, uh, these walls are used very frequently as a bearing system, but somehow are not studied enough in um, faculties uh, and we don't uh, learn enough about them, especially um, uh, we don't learn about them uh, in this sense with uh, earthquake loading. Uh, what we like to say about uh, this system when comparing it to other uh, bearing systems for horizontal loads is that it has uh, enough bearing capacity to withstand these kind of loads, so it can withstand the earthquake load, but also enough stiffness to limit horizontal displacements. So, for example, when comparing it to reinforced concrete ramps, which is something that is studied much more, uh, they have uh, more stiffness, so are able to limit horizontal displacements as well, which is also very important, obviously. Uh, another thing that was um, good when it comes to reinforced concrete walls that we tried to, that that is used and we try to use here. Uh, is that they are suitable for ductile shaping. Uh, and uh, that's where capacity design method comes into play. Um, uh, and now, uh, next I will explain uh, what, uh, what it really is and uh, how, how do we uh, use it. So in general, if we're just talking about um, all the structures uh, when it comes to reinforced concrete, uh, we want to uh, use the positioning of uh, and shaping of uh, reinforcement and the shaping of the whole structure uh, to make it more ductile. So in the case uh, of uh, reinforced concrete walls, we can allow the formation of a plastic hinge uh, at the bottom of the wall. Uh, so for, uh, for us, uh, it's important to um, then after having this place at the bottom of the wall after uh, deciding that that's where our plastic region is going to be, then we need to uh, design this part um, properly so it has enough um, capacity to withstand the moment forces and the uh, shear, so it has enough shear force, shear force capacity as well. Uh, after that, the area outside of uh, that plastic region uh, it needs to be designed so it behaves elastically. So the rest of the wall remains is in the elastic area, while this bottom part is the one that um, that goes to the plastic area. Uh, the uh, the picture uh, uh, marked with D is the one that shows the ductile behavior uh, for um, a reinforced concrete wall. And then uh, the capacity design method has a lot of uh, various regulations and laws that need to be uh, that need to be respected in order to um, get to this place in order to uh, you in order to use it properly. Um, so next, uh, I will talk about the experimental uh, research. And in this research, the capacity design method uh, was respected, and the uh, laws of the capacity design method were used to uh, design these walls for the shaping and dimensioning and so on. Uh, so for design for the for designing the walls. Uh, what they did in this experimental research, which was conducted at the University of Zurich by Professor uh, Hugo Bachmann and his associates in 1999, can really be seen easily here on this uh, upper left picture here. Uh, so what they did is they uh, made models in scale one to two for half of a wall of a six-story building. So we have, uh, these are the models, and then they performed the experimental research on these models. So there are, these are the models in 
multi-tool scale and it's just a uh, half of the wall of a six-story building. They apply the vertical and horizontal load. Obviously, the horizontal load uh, was supposed to uh, mimic the uh, the seismic load on the uh, on the wall, while the vertical force was supposed to simulate the rest of the weight of, of, of the wall. How they did that, how they performed the experimental research, was also uh, interesting and important for us. Is uh, that they for the vertical force they, they applied the uh, pre-stressing cables, as uh, they can be seen here on this picture, while the horizontal uh, force was uh, applied. Uh, with the actuator. The actuator was uh, positioned at a height that corresponds to the resultant of a nearly triangular seismic load on, uh, on our wall. The actuator has a possibility to apply the load or rather the displacement uh, on the wall in both directions. So here we can see just an example of a one lateral displacement program that they uh, use on one of the walls and as we can see the we apply the displacement in one direction then the other and so on uh, increasing the displacement as we go on at the research uh, they tested a lot of uh, various um, parameters and um, monitored a lot of things uh, we concentrated as i said on the force displacement curves so they monitored the force at the actuator and the displacement of the wall that they are applying and then uh, they were able to form uh, these force displacement curves uh, that can be uh, seen just uh, like a sketch here uh, also they monitored uh, cracks and that's something that we uh, looked into as well not into much detail but you will see what we did with our model um, the materials that they used obviously uh, the walls were reinforced concrete walls so they needed concrete and reinforcement and they tested uh, the concrete that uh, they used for all six walls they made um, uh, several uh, cylinders it was six cylinders for every every wall and um, performed uh, the standard tests and then were able to form these kind of uh, stress strain relation curves and also uh, these tables uh, these tables were very important for us um, because we had specific values that, that we could work with in our model and these are all the uh, values that, that can be inputted in uh, Diana as well for the models that we decided for so this was also uh, another thing that was very uh, an important part uh, of the work um, similarly for reinforcement they tested these reinforcement bars that they used on the walls and formed the stress strain relations as well as putting all of those specific values into the table uh, that then we used later. Um, in total, uh, at the experimental research, six walls were tested, uh, and we decided to make the numerical modeling for uh, three walls, and those were the wall one, wall three, and wall six. Now, obviously, it was very important for us to test uh, more than just one wall, because we wanted to show that our model is uh, predictable. We decided for these three walls, because um, they have an increase in, in reinforcement ratio as we go on. So for example, wall one was the wall with the uh, least, with the smallest uh, reinforcement ratio. Um, then uh, wall six was the one with the highest reinforcement ratio and wall three was in the middle. Also wall six, uh, as you can see, was the one with, the, with these largest uh, confinement zones. And this was also very important for us. And I will mention this and talk about this later. Uh, for now, um, you can see that these are these are the reinforce reinforcement layouts for the free walls uh, that we use. All the other geometry is uh, same for each of the free walls that we modeled. Um, after performing the research, as I said, they formed these four displacement curves. Even just from here, we can see what I was talking about. For example, if we just throw an envelope following the following the this outer line uh, for the cyclic loading we can see that the loading capacity for example for wall one was around 320 kilonewtons for wall three it was about 420 and wall six around uh, 520 kilonewtons also the wall, uh, wall six was the most ductile uh, one so therefore there was uh, much more energy dissipation 
uh, for this wall, which is basically geometrically just the area under this uh, curve. Uh, also, I mentioned that uh, they monitored uh, the formation of cracks and then made uh, photographs and sketches like this. Uh, uh, these are all the um, data that then we were able to use later uh, when making our model and also comparing it to uh, these specific real life uh, results. Um, so we get to this um, main part uh, for uh, this webinar, which is the numerical analysis of these walls in Diana Fair. Uh, just from the beginning, when uh, looking into Diana and the possibilities, it was uh, very clear to us that there is a um, huge opportunity to do um, a lot of uh, different stuff and to go into uh, usage of a lot of different models. Uh, but also we looked at some of the recommendations for modeling and decided to go for a model that's going to be simple, but that's still going to be able to respect everything from the experimental research as much as possible, all the possible uh, values, and to replicate uh, those, and to replicate that research as much as possible, which is obviously why we do the modeling. So first of all, the uh, elements that we used were the regular plane stress elements. Just from uh, looking at the first sketches, it was uh, very uh, obvious uh, that this is an in-plane uh, problem. So for these elements, we need to apply the load uh, in their own uh, plane, which is the case uh, uh, for this problem, and also uh, the stresses out of the plane are neglected. Uh, the reinforcement elements that we used were the embedded reinforcement in a 2D grid. Um, we avoided using uh, 3D elements, that was also uh, one of the ideas, but we, after completing the work and during the work, realized that uh, for this kind of problem, uh, a 2D model uh, is enough. This is uh, an example of an embedded reinforcement, and what it really means for us is that there is no relative movement between uh, reinforcement and concrete, so the displacements are the same for our reinforcement and our concrete. Next, it was uh, important for us to uh, go from uh, the reinforcement layout that we had in the uh, from the experimental research and to go to these uh, planes of equivalent thickness. And what that means is just that we need to have the area from the bars, from real bars, equal to the area uh, of the cross-section of the uh, plane with an equivalent thickness. So in Diana, you have a possibility to enter the diameters, the positioning, or rather the uh, distance between the between these bars, and then uh, it is transferred to equivalent thickness or just with uh, a direct input after calculating it yourself. Um, the material models were, uh, for me, uh, the most interesting part and really um, uh, wanted to uh, think about this and uh, decide which uh, models should we be using. So we uh, explored this uh, and looked at uh, a couple of different uh, material models before even uh, starting anything to see uh, which one would be the best and from the recommendations and uh, uh, we decided in the end to use the total strain crack model for concrete and the von Mises model for uh, reinforcement. Um, this uh, model for concrete is uh, one of the models with a smeared crack approach. Now, what that means is that uh, the cracks when forming on the model are, um, so, so to say, smeared um, uh, across the elements. Uh, the best way to understand it is to compare it to uh, the opposing model the, the, with the discrete definition of cracks where we really uh, need to know in advance the position of cracks. And with that, we are limiting ourselves on that position and afterwards limiting ourselves uh, uh, when it comes to the formation of cracks, when it comes to the expansion of these uh, cracks. Uh, so that's not something that we could have used. So we had to go for a, mo uh, for a smeared crack approach that a total strain crack model has. Also, the definition of uh, concrete, uh, the, uh, the definition of compression and uh, tension in concrete was also uh, very simple, and the, the uh, it, it only needed 
these values that we had from the experimental research. So we thought, okay, this uh, these models are simple like this, but really they can uh, represent what we need really well. So for example, for to define a compressive behavior for concrete, you need um, to define the strength of uh, compressive strength of concrete, the corresponding deformation, and then the ultimate deformation, all of the values that we uh, had before as well. Uh, um, next, um, for the tensile behavior, um, we use this kind of um, linear curve uh, uh, where you also need to define the uh, tensile strength and the ultimate deformation. Now, this is the part that was more interesting and more difficult than in general when really um, uh, thinking about concrete, how do we uh, define uh, the tensile behavior. Uh, so, we decided to, for the uh, tensile strength of uh, concrete, uh, define it as just a smaller part of the compressive strength, so like 10% of the compressive strength, um, using certain recommendations and literature. And also, uh, another thing that was even harder was this ultimate deformation when it comes to tensile behavior. Um, so, uh, after exploring the recommendations, we came to a conclusion that uh, you can use, you can um, make that ultimate deformation equal uh, to the deformation of steel uh, corresponding to the yield stress. So this is the uh, yield stress of steel divided by the modulus of steel, therefore the uh, deformation of steel corresponding to the yield stress. Another way to define this uh, softening kind of curve is by defining the uh, area, or rather the energy, uh, under the curve. Uh, and there are also different recommendations for uh, using um, to, to which energy to use. Um, and this would, this would be just a different approach to, uh, to do this thing. Um, in here, it's also important to uh, mention um, this value here, marked with H. And what that is, is really the uh, equivalent size of uh, a finite element in a mesh. So what we do and why is it's important here is that it takes our mesh, it takes the, uh, uh, the size of our mesh elements and really the shape of our elements into account. So, so with this, we um, uh, avoid some problems of localization. Um, this was all important for us to know exactly if we're going to be using models like this that are already uh, defined. We needed to know exactly um, what they were and how they were uh, behaving, so to know if we are uh, close to what we wanted to achieve. Uh, also, I mentioned for reinforcement that we use the von Mises um, uh, model. Uh, really, this is just uh, an example of a bilinear curve, or rather a curve with hardening for uh, for reinforcement bars. So in here, you just needed to define a, a Young's modulus and then define the uh, stresses, the uh, yield stress, the ultimate stress, and the corresponding deformations. And then uh, a curve like this would be formed for our reinforcement. And we decided that this was uh, close enough to what we wanted to achieve. I'm mean, uh, sorry, just before you continue. Yeah. yeah, perfect. I just want to make sure that you click on the screen. There was a ribbon at the bottom. Thanks. Please continue. Uh, sorry. Uh, no, please, please make it full click? screen. Full screen, okay. Yeah, if you go to the yes. same slide. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, no problem. Perfect. Thank you. Is it okay now? Yeah. Beautiful, thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry about that. So, um, the model for reinforcement, as I mentioned, was the von Mises one, again, defining the, defining the uh, specific values that we had from the experimental research. Uh, the, uh, here we can see some of the values for uh, uh, specific values that we use in the uh, models. And for concrete, an interesting thing that you can notice right away is uh, the difference between the values for the unconfined and confined uh, concrete. So this is something that I uh, mentioned earlier and that it was important for us and now I want to uh, explain exactly uh, what it was and how, how we um, 
uh, uh, introduce this into our model as well. Uh, so in general, when looking at this wall, you can see that obviously for this kind of uh, load for a moment uh, uh, across a stronger axis, we have the large stresses at the edges of the wall. That's where we placed the majority of our longitudinal reinforcement. And then also we have these uh, horizontal uh, ties and uh, loops that uh, surround the uh, bars and also give the stability and also surround the concrete. And then what, uh, what happens is that concrete is put in such a pressure state where its uh, compressive strength and uh, its uh, ultimate deformation actually rises. So there is a difference between this middle part of the wall, or rather the concrete, you, the specifics of concrete for this middle part, and uh, the uh, concrete for these um, for the edges. Um, you can also notice that uh, here we didn't use a, a confinement model. Uh, uh, from Diana Fair, uh, we actually use a, a different model, which was the Mender model. Um, and after using its um, properties and after calculating the exact uh, values, we inputted those values. So, for example, you can see for wall one here that we have an increase from 45 megapascals to 50 megapascals. Um, also, the ultimate uh, strain has risen and uh, so on. For reinforcement, uh, it was again, the, uh, uh, it was just needed to define these um, two uh, branches. And then also the very input of geometrical input of reinforcement uh, was done by directly inputting the uh, values, um, of, uh, the values of the equivalent thickness. Um, next, uh, this is uh, what our model looked like a simple model with these uh, uh, confined zones at the edges and the unconfined concrete in the middle. And an another thing that's um, interesting here is this loading plate. So this um, was just really uh, as taken as another recommendation and it was just to avoid any possible uh, problems when, uh, forming the, when forming the mesh. So you just put this part of the wall uh, an elastic part of the, like an elastic concrete, you define it here with a support, and that's where you will, will be applying your load instead of applying it um, directly to uh, your model or to the materials that um, that you used. Um, for wall one, this is an example of a horizontal displacement program that was uh, applied in Diana. Uh, again, the wall, wall one was the one with the lead, with the smallest reinforcement uh, ratio, and it was the least ductile wall out of these three that we uh, tested. Um, before going to the cyclic loading, we decided first to uh, test our model or rather test the mesh dependency and uh, then compared those results with uh, an envelope taken from the cyclic loads from the experimental research. So the curve marked in black here is uh, the envelope uh, or from the research, while these three lines here are the uh, Diana uh, are the curves uh, that were uh, made by us in the Diana, or rather that we were able to gather from uh, Diana. Uh, we used um, three different mesh sizes here uh, with an element size always rectangle with a size of 5, 10 and uh, 20 centimeters. Uh, something that sticks out here is that there is a difference between the initial stiffness of the wall when it comes to uh, uh, the results from the research and the numerical model. Now, this is something that we explained with uh, a couple of uh, different things. Uh, first of all, uh, the very nature of experimental research is uh, that we cannot, uh, or it is very hard or almost impossible really, uh, to achieve an immovable support at the bottom here. Now, this is a research that, again, I'll say wasn't performed at our university, but in general, we have experiences with uh, performing some of these, uh, some of the tests like this, and also encountered a similar uh, problem on other projects. Uh, also, uh, it is possible that uh, uh, since this is just an envelope taken from the cyclic load where we have a uh, uh, load being loaded in a different direction as well, um, the wall is losing its stiffness uh, as we uh, go on. And also, just uh, the, if we look at the 
the cyclic clothing and in general concrete, we know that there are these so-called micro cracks forming by while applying a load like this. So this is something that um, happens in real life, and the uh, stiffness on, of concrete as we go on uh, can drop. Uh, therefore, uh, these are these were uh, our explanations for this. Also, uh, maybe I haven't mentioned, we obviously applied the vertical load as well, uh, equal to the proper size or the proper weight of the rest of the wall, and so on. Um, first of all, I will just show our results here, for example, for cracks uh, and the corresponding uh, displacement that was put on the wall. Um, so, as I said, we didn't go into too much detail, but we in general monitored the formation of these cracks and um, what we concluded is that uh, there was a, a lot of um, uh, similarities with reality as well so for example first after uh, pushing the wall to the right side we have the formation of first cracks on the left side then the expansion of those cracks after pushing the wall to the other side the first cracks on the right side and so on coming to these um, uh, diagonal, so to speak, diagonal uh, cracks forming and the largest cracks being uh, at the bottom. If we compare it to the results from the research, we can see uh, these pictures are in scale, so we can uh, compare the exact uh, sizes, the height of the wall and so on. This is the photograph from the research, while this is the sketch for that, uh, for that wall, in this case wall one. Um, and uh, as we can see here as well, we have the largest cracks, obviously, at the bottom of the wall. And in general, most of our cracks are forming at the uh, bottom part, uh, bottom part of the wall. So when comparing it um, to the uh, cracks that we were able to get, or the results from the model, we can see that um, there are certain similarities. So we concluded some uh, good agreement here. Uh, the important part as well, obviously, the force displacement curves. Um, if we concentrate just on the bottom picture here, which is the complete hysteresis, all the load steps for wall one, um, while these are just the two by two cycles to uh, be able to see everything more clearly, uh, we can see here that for wall one, we have very good agreement uh, when it comes to loading capacity of the wall, while there are some differences when it comes to to stiffness at the unloading of the wall and the uh, energy dissipation, again, the area uh, uh, under the curves. We moved on and made um, uh, another two models for wall three and wall six, and I won't talk uh, about it too much. Again, uh, the walls were very similar. For us, it was just important to show the predictability of the model, so we all we needed to do is change the reinforcement uh, ratios, and that we did that by changing the um, equivalent thicknesses of our plane elements and so on. Also, for in this example, there was, for example, a larger increase in uh, the uh, compressive strength of concrete for the confined zone and so on. Um, the model was very similar, and then after inputting uh, this cyclic load, again, we uh, gathered the results for wall three. Before that, we again tested the mesh dependency. And I want to mention a different thing here is, uh, again, we have a good agreement when it comes to loading capacity, uh, but there is some uh, difference between these three meshes, or rather just this final part. Really, there is no mesh dependency uh, on the first part, but the meshes with uh, more elements uh, uh, lose uh, stability, lost stability uh, earlier. Um, and this is something that's also very common for uh, models with uh, a lot of elements. Uh, we have a lot of possible uh, deformations and displacements, so these um, models can often be a bit less stable. Um, but what was important for us is that the loading capacities had good agreements, and uh, we moved on to uh, cyclic loading. Uh, these are, again, the cycles, and just by looking, for example, some of these, we can see a uh, really good uh, agreement, and then uh, looking at the complete hysteresis for wall free, again, we see good agreement um, when it comes to loading capacity and also energy, dis energy dissipation here as well, and the unloading 
uh, and, and the stiffness at the unloading. Um, for wall six, uh, we have similar things, and uh, uh, this again was the most ductile wall with the largest confinement zones, and it was the wall that had uh, the, con the confined concrete had the largest increase in compressive strength here. Uh, after uh, changing the values, appropriate values for wall six, we moved on to making the model. Uh, the only notable thing here again is how the confined concrete zones are larger now, so we have larger parts of the wall being more ductile and being uh, and having a larger compressive strength. After inputting the cyclic loads and testing the uh, mesh dependency as well, and I want to mention uh, here how. Uh, the the element sizes that we decided uh, for were dependent on the side uh, on the size of the confinement zone. So, for example, for wall six, the uh, size of the confinement zones, when looking at in this direction, was uh, around 38 centimeters. So that's the uh, that was one of the element sizes that we chose. Then a model with uh, um, with double the uh, element size with double the element size and a model with half the that element size. Uh, again, we have a similar trend here, good agreement with loading capacity, but some differences when it comes to um, models with, um, with more uh, 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 finite elements. Um, then we looked at the formation of cracks for this model. Again, similar thing, formation of first crack and so on. But what was important here and uh, for our wall is uh, as I said, it was the most ductile one, therefore it was subjected to uh, most uh, loading or the largest displacements. And as we can see, um, uh, more cracks were formed uh, here. Uh, the height of the cracks was um, larger as well, and the width of the cracks was uh, larger. Uh, this is something that uh, corresponds well to uh, the experimental research, and we concluded uh, good agreement again. Uh, looking at the four displacement curves for this wall. Uh, obviously, from uh, here, uh, from the complete hysteresis, we can see a uh, large area under the curve, so the largest energy dissipation, obviously. Uh, very good agreement when it, agreements when it comes to loading capacity, uh, the stiffness of the wall when unloading, energy dissipation, and so on. Um, so, finally, um, looking at um, all of these results and the uh, comparisons, these uh, are going to be some of the conclusions that we um, drew out. So really, I want to uh, go over this uh, one more time and kind of mention what we uh, did. Uh, so from the beginning, it was clear to us that uh, Diana has a diverse library of material models, but we wanted to show how even with a simpler uh, model like this, uh, you are able to achieve uh, good agreement between the numerical and experimental results. Uh, in general, it, it's always really good when doing something like this to have um, this kind of reality to compare it with, to have uh, uh, to have something to compare your results with. And the experimental uh, research that was done uh, was done very well and professionally, and all the values were. Um, uh, shown and so on, so we were able to um, compare it. Um, the material models um, can be defined with values that can be obtained from standard experimental tests. Uh, so the one, the values that were uh, defined in our model and the values that the researchers used uh, are the very basic uh, values, for example, for concrete and reinforcement. Um, the regular plane stress elements, uh, as I mentioned, proved uh, to be enough for this kind of uh, analysis, um, and there wasn't much difference between models with different finite elements mesh regarding the loading capacity of the walls. Uh, this is the thing that I also mentioned, how uh, the meshes with less finite elements uh, were more stable. Um, the thing that was um, in our minds the whole time is that we wanted to show that this model uh, can be can now be used or, or similar that the material models and the reinforcement model can be used for walls like this and for loading like this uh, with uh, different reinforcement layouts. So these were walls were geometrically 
very similar or rather same, but the uh, reinforcement layouts were different and they were dictating the, uh, for, for example, energy dissipation of the wall. So if we can predict uh, how much more uh, energy will be dissipated by uh, our wall, then we um, have an advantage. Another important thing uh, for us uh, were the uh, formation of uh, cracks and um, this is something that we concluded a good uh, agreement in Diana as well. It was able to uh, show the cracks at the uh, right positions uh, and often in engineering practices that is really what we're looking into. That's that's what interests us. Now if we go, we uh, what could have been done is to go into to more detail about the formation of cracks but for situations like this we want to know that these cracks will be forming at the bottom of the wall that we did a good job of uh, shaping our, our structure. In general uh, a final conclusion um, could be that uh, this kind of modeling in Diana is very capable of, of representing uh, reality of representing at least the uh, experimental research that we concentrated on which was again in a way a simulation of reality because they took uh, half of the walls and applied um, the side and upload the way they did uh, but again uh, if if we as as we as I said we concluded good agreement with the research therefore we could say that it's a really good way to model uh, reinforced concrete walls in general. Another thing is that Diana possess, possesses very strong solvers, so uh, the calculations were not too much time consuming. Another thing uh, was that we paid attention to was exactly that, and that's why we decided for, for example, a regular plain stress element instead of going to 3D if we don't have to, and so on. Um, this is a table that uh, you can look at one more time, which is just a nice way of showing all of these things that um, we did. And the only thing that um, I did mention earlier and the difference between the model and the research was this initial stiffness of the wall. And we tried to explain that with um, the things that I mentioned earlier. And we believe that um, uh, this would not be a, a big problem but in general for example energy dissipation which is very important when it comes to energy, energy dissipation and loading capacity which is very important when it comes to capacity design method had uh, good agreements so the model was uh, able to predict these things uh, really well um, and this is basically the end uh, uh, of my part. Uh, I just want to again thank Maziar for the opportunity and thank you very much for uh, your attentions. Uh, th these are my professors uh, Senad Mejic and Mustafa Krasnitsa and these are our uh, emails here so if you have uh, obviously there will be as I know a uh, session here now as well for questions if there are any. Uh, and in general, these are our emails that you can write us to for suggestions or uh, questions. So um, another thing that I just want to use th this time to say how um, this uh, work that uh, I have done um, was a kind of um, smaller project, if you could say, uh, for our university as well, where we are trying to use um, Diana especially more or softwares like this more and compare um, the modeling like this to experimental, uh, experimental research. So we have uh, some other stu students working on uh, things like this as well on similar topics on earthquake loading and stuff like that and using for example the Maikawa Fukura model that you could have seen for concrete and so on. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention again. This is where I will end it. Thank you. Thank you, Emir. It was very interesting, and also thanks for other associated who were supervising and uh, helping you with this uh, nice uh, project, work, and lab, and also validation with uh, numerical simulation.